for this next act. Uh, I mean, everybody's here for him. He travels all over the world telling jokes, telling great stories, making people think. Make sure that you open your minds and your mouths. If you want to laugh, laugh. Don't be hold it in. I saw you hold it in a little bit. Now, we, we feed off that. You had me starving up here. I had a, between you and my kids, I was hungry. Uh, and so, so yeah, just, just laugh and let it all out because uh, we're here to have a good time. So give it up for our world famous Alvin Williams! <laughs> fucked up energy right now like uh, were you surprised that it was me like my picture was on the wall for a long time before we started my name has been here the entire fucking time you oh he is here like that, that was strange that was a weird vibe like all you all have this vibe like i'm the last person to show up to the orgy and you finished already and you're just like now you're just being polite you know it's like there was one more guy wasn't it like eh, well we finished but yeah yeah we'll stay we'll stay just let him that's how i feel good to see you all man this means a lot i love Boise. i love this crowd i only get this type of crowd in Boise, idaho you know why it's special to me i'll tell you because Boise, idaho crowds are mostly people who've never seen me in their life or as i like to call it my fan base <laughs> mixed in with people who've known me for 16 years there's no in between. You've either never seen me in your fucking life or you've known me for 16 years and when you all blend together, just seeing the reactions on your face when I speak, the people who've never seen me before, they're like, is he serious about that? The people who've known me for 16 years, they're like, he's worse. Like, I have the text messages of the bitch he's talking about right now if you want to see it. He's really like this, but shut up, let him finish. Like, that's... I know you all heard earlier, I'm filming a special. I'm not. I'm not filming a special. So unpucker your assholes right now. Like, <laughs> relax. There are cameras. The cameras are specifically for me, okay? For me. I will go home, jerk off a little bit, then look <laughs> at my... <laughs> this is all for me, relax. Because weird shit happens when you tell somebody you're filming a special, like everybody's like, oh, I, I don't, is he going to look at me? Like, no, no. I filmed a special in July. It's done. It's done. It's out. Okay? It's already out. It's called Truth or Bullshit. Go check it out. It's on Amazon Prime. It's done. All right? For those of y'all who don't know how special works, here's the deal. I travel the entire world. I try out material. I perfect the material. I put it on film for about an hour. And then when that's done, I release it forever. It's gone. It's gone. Can't do those jokes anymore. They're done. They're finished. That's it. Whenever that happens, nobody talks about what happens after you film the special. You have to start all over again from scratch. Whenever I have to start all over again from scratch, I start here. <laughs> I felt like you should be honored by that, but you all, you all took that as a joke, like, oh uh, yeah, who are we gonna tell? Like, this is... No, but really, on, honest to God, for those of y'all who don't know me, the people who have never seen me in their life, my comedy journey started 16 years ago in Boise, Idaho. So as that's, that's why, by tradition, I always come back here whenever I'm starting my new material because I want to start it here. This is my Fortress of Solitude. This is where I start whatever I'm doing. So we're starting the journey again on new material together. Are you all willing to start that with me tonight? Okay. All right. Good. Good. Now, again, I want you all to see that special. I worked really hard on it. You will notice I was in super sick shape in that special. I was... <laughs> People still laugh at that part. Like when I say it, like, yeah, I get it. I'm not in that shape now. I got it. I got it. I was in shape when it counted. Okay? <laughs> I'm gained a little. I've got a dad bod. I'm not a dad. It's fucking with me a little bit. <laughs> Turns out you don't need one to get the other. I just, sometimes I look in the mirror. I'm like, maybe I got kids I don't know about. What the fuck is happening with my, my physique? <laughs> can't, can't tell. Because I'm 38 now. My friends are like, hey, you got to watch that with, with, 
with the weight. But like, you might be pre-diabetic. I'm like, you mean fat as fuck. You mean fat, right? That's what you mean. You mean I'm, I'm getting fat. Like, what? I, I get offended by the term pre-diabetic. Like, don't label me with some shit I'm not yet. Like, how dare you? I, can you wait until I get to the actual thing before you name me the thing that I'm not yet but can get to? I'm not diabetic. Aren't we all pre-diabetic, technically, if we don't make the right choices? Like, don't get offended. That's what they're doing when they're talking to pre-diabetic people. That's your doctor saying, yep, I'm calling it. You're not gonna listen to shit I say, I give up. That's, just let that Ben and Jerry's kick in. Like, it's the same shit. That's a strange thing to label somebody. That's like if I holler at a girl and I'm like, hey, hey, you wanna go out? And she's like, no, I'm like, you will. You're just pre-lonely right now. Like, just, just let, <laughs> just keep eating that Ben and Jerry's. You'll come back around. I guess. That's, that's <laughs> it's been like this my whole life. Like, I, I yo-yo. Like, one, one minute I'm in shape, next minute I'm not. It's been like that since I was a little kid. I was a chubby baby, then I graduated when I was 10 years old to something called Husky. <laughs> Any former Husky kids in the audience? Be proud. This is our moment. Former Husky kids? Yeah. Did you have the husky pants? Did you have the pants that had the little husky dog on it? There were actual pants called Husky. The brand was Husky. They had a dog. Our bullies were making our clothes. Like, they were making it easy. That was like, that was dog whistling for bullies in school. They're like, I knew I wanted to call you something, but like, that's, that's it. Kids used to make fun of me. I did not let that bother me because my best friend at the time, she's still the smartest person I know to this day. Her name is Julie Litwin. She is one of the smartest people in the world. She is a doctor. I hope you never meet her because if you do, you're in the ER. She's a wonderful human though. She's wonderful. And we were 10 years old. She told me, Alvin, you are not husky. You were just growing into your new shell like the rock lobster. That's what she said, like the rock lobster. I said, what? She said, the rock lobster, when it gets bigger from a baby, it gets uncomfortable in its original shell, so it has to shed out of its original shell. And when it sheds, it's unprotected in the ocean, so it has to hide from the predators. And when it hides from the predators, it gets bigger and stronger and grows a bigger shell, and that's you. You're just growing into your bigger, stronger shell. <laughs> like, we're all adults, so we realize how beautiful what she did for me was. Now. At the time, I was like, okay, so sometimes there's just delicious de-shelled lobsters just swimming around in the ocean, all succulent and delicious, and nobody's eating these. I've never seen a de-shelled lobster. Can't you just imagine it swimming? I was imagining it swimming, not even ocean water, just hot butter that it was swimming in. Like that's, you know, in my mind, like the rocks were cheddar biscuits. You know what I was on? I was a husky kid. That's what I cared about. <laughs> we're all pre-diabetic. I can prove it. I can prove it. Everybody in this room is pre-diabetic. Watch this. Just shout out the answer when I ask you this question. What's your favorite snack to have while you're looking for something to eat in the kitchen? Do you hear your fucking selves right now? You don't find that weird at all that we're eating food while we're looking for food to eat. You don't think that's strange? You don't think that's a bad habit? Maybe we all need to stop before something happens later on in our life. I heard gummy bears, cream cheese, potato chips. Why are you looking for something keto? You're like, oh, these, these calories don't, these are pantry calories. And I look like, this, this, this doesn't count. <laughs> I'm like, what is in here? I can't find nothing. Like, that's us. That's all of us. Food runs your life. You don't think food runs your life. I promise you it runs your life. You think other stuff runs your life. It doesn't. When the pandemic started and they shut down all the movie theaters, I was like, oh shit, I love the movies. That's what I love to do. They shut down the theaters. I can't go to the theaters. I was messed up because I loved going to the movies. Did I? Or did I just love eating candy in the dark around strangers? Like who, who was I really? You gotta ask yourself the real questions. Be real with yourself. One time I'm driving through Oklahoma City, right? I see a sign for a place called the Rib Crib. And I get there, and they were out of ribs. I gotta be honest, I thought there were gonna be more black people at my show on a Saturday night because you all had no reaction to what the fuck I just said, and I felt like that was a national tragedy. I thought I was gonna take like five minutes, we could cry, get our feelings out. I was gonna have a mic set up right here so everybody could, could just share how they feel. I was at a place called the Rib Crib, and I get there, and they were out 
of ribs. I know. Can you imagine my dismay? They only needed one thing to keep the promise on the sign. The one thing you need to keep the promise on the sign, you don't have. That's like the Kardashians having a talent show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was eight people who had the right fucking reaction to what I just said. The rest of you all like, wait, aren't they talented? No. Are you confused by what I just said? I know, they've been on TV for over a decade. Nobody's played a bass guitar, twirled a baton, nothing. They're not talented. Here's what's happened. That joke? That was the second joke I ever wrote in my life. I wrote that joke 15 years ago. And you know what used to happen? Everybody used to clap. Sometimes they carry me off stage. I was like, Alvin, Alvin, I'm like, oh, get off me. I got other stuff to say. Come on, you guys, don't embarrass me. As I get older, 15 years later, people have a different reaction. I was on a cruise ship. Girl walks up to me at the end. You shouldn't talk about Kim like that. She's a lawyer now. That's accurate. But Kim Kardashian is a lawyer the way Kanye West was a presidential candidate. You understand that, right? It's true, but get the fuck out of my face. Like, you can't take what you said serious. Kanye West is hurting people right now. Oh, I'm, I, excuse me. Here's what I'm talking about, about the 15-year thing. He doesn't go by Kanye West. It's just yay. And I need to respect that it's just yay. And I need to respect that yay put a t-shirt out there for his season nine fashion show, and it said, White Lives Matter. And when I saw it, I was like, ooh, the All Lives Matter people are gonna come get you. They get so pissed off when you name one race and single them out and say that they matter. Ooh, they're gonna get you, and nobody came. What the fuck? Nobody came. It's almost as if all lives matter meant white lives matter this entire time. Imagine that. Can you believe that? I swear, when I saw that white lives matter, I was like, I know somebody's gonna be going up to him like, hey, all lives matter and mean it, right? But none of the all lives matter people came out. They were busy. They were too busy like filming the Jeffrey Dahmer sequel on Netflix or something. Like, I don't know what you all do. I learned everything I needed to know in that moment. It's the same shit, it is. You don't have to say white lives matter, we know. We know, that's not, that's not, a, it's not a thing that we were concerned about. That's like going to an abortion rally and holding up a sign that says, my penis, my choice. Like, yeah, we know. We got it. You got the dick, you get to choose things, I got it. You didn't have to re-say it. That's why we're having the rally. That's, that's strange that you would bring that up at a time like this. It seems inappropriate to some. 15 years changes the world. Because here's the real issue. Here's what's happening. The Kardashians are at critical mass right now when it comes to your opinion of them. Because Generation Z is old enough to see Kim Kardashian and go, there is an entrepreneur, billionaire woman who's a lawyer on the side. You all just remember her as a hoe. <laughs> and that's your problem. You're in the wrong. Not Generation Z, people are allowed to change. And in 15 years, she's allowed to be that. She's allowed. But I know there's some people in this room because of the generation gap, they're saying, well, I, I still don't, I don't want my daughter to be like Kim Kardashian. Why not? Why not? Why? Your daughter has just as much a chance to be a billionaire as she does a hoe when she grows up. <laughs> Same percentages, I promise you. Number for number. I'm not saying your daughter is a hoe, specifically. But I am saying every hoe is somebody's daughter. You understand that, right? That's just science. You understand that no parent like raised their daughter to be a hoe. You get that, right? Hoes happen. I'll repeat that. Hoes happen. You don't control that. You don't. First of all, hoes aren't born, they're made. <laughs> they're made. You didn't come to this world a hoe. Somebody offered you the perfect proposition one day, and boom, you Manchurian candidated yourself into a hoe. Imagine that. 
You never thought about it? Everybody in this room has potential. You understand that, right? Every single one of you in this room has what it takes in you to be a hoe. You just need the proper proposition. That's all it takes. And you are no different than anybody else. I promise you that. Everybody in here has played that game. You know that game. You ever play that game? Hey, would you, would you suck a dick for a million dollars? And then we all laugh because half of you bitches been doing it for free. Like, like they were like, you know, like we all just have a, like a quick chuckle. Like, <laughs> that's your life, you know? And then every dude, when we hear that, a dick for a million dollars, no. Hey, for those of you all... <laughs> For those of you all who've never played this game, listen to me, hear me, wait, all right? Wait, don't ever accept the first offer, okay? Don't, don't. When they ask you, would you suck a dick for a million dollars? Always say no, I promise you, they're gonna come with more money in this scenario. I promise, it doesn't just end when you say no, oh, all right, well, okay. You made your choice and we'll reconvene. No, never, every time. Would you suck a dick for a million dollars? No. Ten million dollars? <laughs> no, 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 no. A billion dollars. It always jumps from ten million to a billion every time. They do not waste time. It goes one million, ten million, a billion. And everybody in here would suck a dick for a billion dollars. Don't play yourself. Don't, including me. Don't play yourself. You kidding me? I'd suck a dick for a billion dollars quickly. Quickly. It is fiscally irresponsible to not suck a dick for a billion dollars. You understand how much money that is? There's 52 people in this room. I could spend a million apiece to have all you killed for knowing that I would suck a dick for a billion dollars and still have $948 million left to do with whatever I please with my new life with all of y'all dead and gone. All of you. Don't play yourself. I just want you all to understand. I know it seems like, well, this is a ridiculous scenario. But technically, if you take 15 years in consideration, Kim Kardashian sucked a dick for a billion dollars. That's the timeline, whether you want to be offended or not. That's what went down. If you don't think that's what went down, would she have a billion dollars without sucking that dick that all of you all saw? No. There you go. Holes happen. They happen. There's nothing you can do. They, they're, they're here or they're not. You do not control that at all. You think you control the whole flow? You don't know. You don't. You want to control something? Control the pimps. Cut the head off the snake. You can see it. Look, look. Pimps are not made. Pimps are born. <laughs> pimps are born. Okay? You all don't pay attention to the signs. You can see a pimp coming a mile away. If you just open your eyes. They're all around you. Okay, that pimp gene kicks in about six, seven years old, something like that. You're just not paying attention. One time I was in Old Country Buffet, minding my own damn business. Two kids were next to the chicken fingers. One of them goes, they're out of chicken fingers. The other one goes, what did they do, fly away? Ah, ah. That's a pimp laugh. That's a pimp laugh. Arrest that seven-year-old before he slaps us all. You can't just stand there. Nobody else laughs like that. Ah, ah, ah. That's a fucking pimp. You kidding me? <laughs> Please. You gotta pay attention to the signs. My nephew is 15 years old. He is six foot eight. Has a size 16 shoe. Four different colleges, University of Oregon, Georgetown, Western Kentucky, and University of Illinois have all offered him scholarships already to play basketball. He is the fifth ranked kid in the state of Illinois. In Illinois. I'm a sneakerhead. I love buying people shoes who I love. I can't buy him shoes because every shoe that he has has been given to him. I didn't know what to get for him. What can I do for you? I said, man, can I get you anything for your birthday? He asked for a fur coat.
You think I don't know what's going on? I'm gonna give him a fur coat. He's going around looking like biracial Big Bird. Not on my watch. That's a pimp. That's a pimp in progress. And I won't let it happen, okay? I care. Most of that story is true. Most of it. <laughs> you would be shocked at the parts that aren't true versus the parts that are very, very true. I got him to coat. <laughs> the rest of that, it's true. I, I feel guilty about it, so I just had to, like in a parallel universe, I would have done what was right. <laughs> Appreciate you all taking a ride with me. Not, not judging me, you know? Just not. Y'all are beautiful. Beautiful. Don't look at him, look at me. I called you beautiful. He didn't do it. Y'all are beautiful. <laughs> she looked at him. She's like, am I beautiful? He was like, yeah, baby. <laughs> you beautiful, you beautiful. <laughs> she looked at you to take her compliment, my man. That's what I'm talking about. You better check her phone. Adam Levine texted her twice since I've been on stage. I promise you that. It's a good looking woman. Adam Levine moves fast. That's... <laughs> that dude. He's a victim. <laughs> no, no. Hear me. Hear me. <laughs> I saw those text messages. Every text message he sent, I said those words. <laughs> I have sent those, I've sent that. I can't believe how fucking hot you are. Fucking wow. I've said that two weeks ago and meant it. And meant it. Okay? Do you know what you're dealing with? All right? Me and Adam Levine, same. We're the same. Okay? Adam Levine suffers from a rare disease called BMV. That's bitch made voice. If I'm gonna talk to you all about this, you all need to be serious. I am a BMV survivor. You all have to understand how hard it is. I don't have a deep voice. If I get women, it's not gonna come from my sexy voice. I gotta text my feelings, okay? If I get horny, I gotta text those things in writing. The writing is sexy. Me texting, take your panties off, is different from me calling, take your panties off. Come on, girl. Take them off. You see? This doesn't work. BMV is real. <laughs> so here's what's going on, all right? Every man in here has had a bout with BMV in their time. And it's typically when somebody catches you in a lie. You ever catch a man in a lie? You ever notice his inner child comes out, tries to protect him, sounds a little something like this, what, huh, I don't even know her. That's BMV. You gotta give your man time to guess. When you scare your man, that baby, what, I don't know, I don't even know, I don't know where she came from. <laughs> you have to understand what this man is going through. When BMV happens, when it affects you, you realize, oh man, my voice is never gonna get deeper than this. I'm stuck with this. What am I gonna do? I have to prove that I'm a man too. I'm masculine. What's the quickest way to show you masculine? Get a bunch of women, right? That's what this man is struggling with. All right, now, I, just, I just want you all to take a second, take a second, all right? Close your eyes and think of the least shittiest Maroon 5 song. Just whatever comes to you. Just the least, the least, like, don't hurt yourself. They're all shitty, don't hurt yourself. Just, just pick one so we can move on. They're, they're all shitty, just, just, you know. Yes, please. Like, just, just pick one. Just find it. Have you ever heard his voice and been like, there's a man I can trust. It's been in your face the whole time. So let's get real. Let's get real with each other. Let's, let's delve into the situation. You know why it died down? Remember, it got big for a second. People made their memes. They laugh, ha, ha, ha. Then it died down. You know why it died down? Because they went to his wife and they said, how do you feel about all of this? And you know what she said? She said, I was fine with the text messages. That's, that's how we 
role. I was more embarrassed by the way that you all handled it in the media. She was fine with it. Can we all take a second to stop putting our thousand dollar morals on million dollar couples? You don't know their life. Quit putting your bullshit on them. All right. You don't know their relationship agreement. You don't. You just project your bullshit on them. He's dating a Victoria's Secret model, married her. How did she get him? You think she wasn't getting those bullshit texts from him? It's the same shit. You think she doesn't know the game? It's the same things. Do you think Jeff Bezos' divorce was the same as your divorce? Fuck you. Are you kidding me? Do you know what happened when he went through a divorce? Okay, first of all, Jeff Bezos, when he got through a divorce, he was the world's richest man. World's richest man, all right? Now, I respect him already because if I was the world's richest man, there would be no such thing as cheating. I would pay to get that word banned from every dictionary that's in the world. That doesn't exist anymore. I'll pay whatever I need to. There is no more cheating. I'd pay people to cheat for me. I don't have to do it. I got all the money. What's the point? Well, you know, they're, they're not different than us because they make more money. Everybody puts their pants on one pant leg at a time. I promise you, Jeff Bezos wakes up in the morning, there's a fucking machine that takes him up by his arms, and two robots come up and put his pants on both pants legs at a time. He doesn't give a fuck. He's different than you all. You know what happened? When he divorced his wife, she became the richest woman in the world. And then the net worth that he had left, he tripled that in a couple years during the pandemic, got himself a girl who I don't know what race she is. She's sexy. It works enough. He's dressed like Pitbull going to the Super Bowl. He's got a blinged out AARP card. He's different than you. Quit putting your thousand dollar bullshit on billion dollar people. Their life is different, and that's fine. Well, however they want to define their relationships, that's fine. You should take a note from them. Define your relationships the way you want to define them, not by the way other people want to, because everybody's in delusions about what it is to be in a relationship anyway. I can prove it. What the fuck is a mutual breakup? That's not real. That doesn't exist. You can both be miserable at the same time, but you were the one who started that. I promise you, okay? There's no such thing as a mutual, you know who dumped who, but when you ask them what happened, <laughs> the person that, that dumped the other person, they're like, hey, I, I just, I, I had to grow with my life. Like, I just <laughs> had to put that to the side. That's, that wasn't who I was anymore. I outgrew them, and hey, I had to cut ties. Person got dumped, they're like, well, we both decided that this is <laughs> what we needed, and it was, <laughs> we both moved on at exactly the same time. You know how weird that would be, an actual mutual breakup? Both of you all in a room. I got something to, oh, oh no, 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 you, you go first, you go first, you go first. Okay, all right, all right, never mind. Uh, uh, all right, all right, all right we'll, we'll say it at the same time, okay. One, two, three, I want a divorce. Oh my God, jinx, jinx, jinx. Oh, you packed my bag too? You packed my, I packed you a bag too, that's you. <laughs> you ungrateful bitch. You, <laughs> wow, that is so cool. Don't let people define you. You all lambasted Leonardo DiCaprio for what? For what? Because he was in relationships, consensual relationships, with women who were very happy, and then they turned 25, and he went, all right, next. I know, it sounds kind of fucked up in a way. You understand, I, I can actually hear your assholes puckering up because it's date night. I, I hear it, I hear, like I hear that. But hear me, okay? Leonardo DiCaprio has a history of dating women probably between two to three years, and then when they turn 25, they break up, all right? So, on the outside, you're like, that seems a little fucked up. Uh, okay, well, what's the problem? Is she not an adult? She's, a, she's, she's an adult, it's 25. That's like three years out of college. You're a real adult, you're a real person. So let's think about this for a second. Why is he doing this? What could he possibly be seeing in these women? First of all, himself. <laughs> Secondly, maybe there's more to it. Again, quit putting thousand dollar bullshit on million dollar people. Have a million dollar mindset and you'll think different. Why is he doing this? 25, why is, why, what's, what's significant about that? Okay, it's 2022. 
Let's subtract 25 years from 2022. What year is that? You all, this, you know, this is how rumors get started, Idaho. Like, are you fucking... Shout it out. 1997, what was the number one movie in 1997? Titanic. Titanic was the number one movie in 1997, which means if you were 25 or younger, you were born 1997 or later, which means that you probably never saw the movie Titanic. It wasn't in your zeitgeist when you grew up in Generation Z, which means when he's on a date with you, you probably won't ask some stupid shit like, so why didn't Rose just let you on the door at the same time? I don't understand. That just doesn't make sense. I've watched that movie since I was a kid. She could have just let you up there. I didn't write the movie, bitch. God, it's got to be a way to not get this question every time I want a fucking date. <laughs> Million dollar mindset. Okay? People calling him toxic. He's a good man. That's not toxic masculinity. I promise you that. It's not. You know what's toxic masculinity never gets talked about? Male cheerleading. <laughs> Let's talk about it now. Nobody's been talking about this. I've been wanting to talk about this for a long ass time. Can we all agree that anybody <laughs> who became a male cheerleader in high school, you were trying to get some pussy and things got out of hand. <laughs> things got out of hand. There was a girl you liked. She was a cheerleader. You saw a loophole. You couldn't play basketball. Things got out of hand. And then you got good at it. You got really good at it. You know how I know male cheerleading is fucked up? Because after college, you don't get to do it anymore. <laughs> Your career's over. I could be wrong. Is there, is there, there a bunch of intramural male cheerleaders in here? Just, just keeping the dream going? Is that not? Okay. All right, pick your battles. Don't let other people define you. We're better than that. We are. We are. Because sometimes, I want you all to think about it because I know it's date night for a lot of you all in here. You don't want to be single in 2022. I promise, you don't. What you think single is, it's not the way it used to be even four or five years ago. Keep who you have right now. Love them. Cherish them. Because you can't do any better. That never, that never works the way it's supposed to. Every time in my head, I, when I say you can't do any better, I expect people to start crying and hugging whoever they're with. Every time you all laugh your ass off, like, ha ha, okay, okay, okay. That's enough. I can do better than this. I just, come on. That, that was funny when he said it that way. I feel like he meant it. You. Hold on to who you have, man. Look, I'm 38 years old. I'm single now. I was actually, at one point, I was excited to be single because I thought, like, this is, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the tricking bitches stage, you know? I'm 38 years old. I got money. I didn't have money when I was younger, but I got the money now. Like, I thought that was, like, I can date 15 years up, 15 years down, and it's appropriate, you know? I couldn't do that at 22. Fuck that life. I, but I'm saying, like, I, can, I, was, I was excited about that. I, I was a sugar daddy for a day and a half. I couldn't handle it. That's... I deserved better. I did. These women are different now. First of all, Generation Z, they know life is bullshit already. Like, they're not optimistic at all. I thought that was the whole point. When you date the 20-year-olds, they're supposed to like be like, life is great. For those of y'all who don't know, when you're 20 to 29, as a woman, the whole world is Christmas. Everybody just giving you gifts you didn't earn. You didn't do shit for those gifts, but everybody's giving you, you gifts, and you're like, this is amazing. And then, when you're 30 to 39, as a woman, it's still Christmas, but you know Santa isn't real. You know it. You know it. You're getting the gifts, but you're, you're skeptical. You're like, how long do we have to keep doing this? This is, I know what you want. Like, don't. And you see the 20-year-olds going, Christmas is amazing. You're like, you know what, bitch? Just wait. Just wait. You don't know. You don't know. And women 40 to 49, you're like, fuck it. I'll buy my own toys. I don't need Santa. I don't. I'm good. I'll celebrate Kwanzaa if I feel like. I hadn't done that one yet. <laughs> you all got it. Cool. All right. That's Kwanzaa. Uh, explain it in the car. I don't have time for that. That's, that joke made me smile. Like, that's, 
Y'all don't understand. I, yeah, I was a sugar daddy. It was, it was, it was quick. It was short lived. Didn't, didn't, didn't go long. All right. I was an Instagram boyfriend for six hours. Six. I didn't sign up for that life. I took a picture of the girl. She cropped me out in the photo. I'm not talking about I took a picture with her. I was the one who took the picture. My reflection was in the fucking window behind her. She cropped my reflection out of the, I'm not good enough to have my reflect. You took my reflection out? That's my soul. You stole my soul. I'm not good enough to have a soul. That's the devil. The devil takes the soul. I dated you to feel young, not unborn. Like this didn't feel good. It's frustrating. I was waiting. The whole club life, like clubs change after the pandemic. I remember during that time, like I really thought I could handle this. When the pandemic was going down and the clubs closed, I thought I got this, right? Because I don't have to go to the clubs anymore. I, I don't have to be the old man at the club. But they don't know that I'm the old man at the club because they don't see my old man ass in the club. I'm bald, first of all. If I walk into a club, I start sweating, all this shit is coming down, it doesn't look cool. There's nothing to catch it when you're bald. It just, it just comes all the way down. You can't look sweet, so can I get you a drink? Like, what's going on down? Like, like it's, it's not sexy, it's not cool. I'm short, the bartenders can't see, I'm trying to order a drink. It's loud in there, they can't hear I'm smart. It's frustrating. It didn't used to be like that. When I was younger, Life was good in the clubs. First of all, I could dance. I could. And all those dances they used to do, I can still do those. But they kept changing the dances. That's not my fault. When I was 21 years old, this was a dance. Remember that? Lean with it, rock with it, lean with it, rock with it. That was a dance. I was getting pussy off that. You understand me? Life was good. I danced my ass off. Fat Joe had a song back then. I say my homies don't dance. We just pull up our pants and do the rock away. Lean back. Lean back. Do you see this lazy shit that I'm doing right now? This was a dance. This is one step away from sit your ass down as a dance. We were that close. Just one more year of this lazy shit. The DJs would have been like, oh, you know what to do. Find the nearest chair. Like, oh, shit. Like, <laughs> like look at him. He can dance his ass off. <laughs> it was frustrating. Like, it's a different time now. Everything's changed. Comedy changed. The things you could talk about before, you can't talk about now. I was on a cruise ship during the pandemic. Seven months, seven months, they didn't let me off the ship. Seven months, I got paid, don't get it twisted. Like, right? <laughs> but that's, that's what it took, seven months, they're like, you can't get off the ship. People can come to you, but you can't get off the ship. I was there seven months. Felt like a prison sentence, because when I got off the ship, the whole world had changed. First of all, racism was over. <laughs> I know, because when I got on that ship, it was July of 2021. When I got on that ship, we were fighting. The Black Lives Matter, no, all lives matter. I came back, I was like, what happened to the Black Lives Matter versus all lives matter? They were like, we stopped Asian hate. I'm like, <laughs> what? What? No, 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 the Black Lives Matter, all lives matter thing. Like, what, what happened? Like, yeah, we stopped Asian hate. Do you have a problem? <laughs> No, no, I don't have a problem. And I thought about it, I'm like, that's not ridiculous. Maybe that is how it ended. Because black people and white people, we love Asians. <laughs> Completely love them. I remember when everybody was fighting in the streets and looting. I remember black people and white people were holding hands outside the Panda Express, just like protecting it <laughs> so nobody would go in there. And the Mexicans got a pass as they were cooking in the Panda Express. <laughs> so like everybody was all together in that moment. We were looking out for each other. I love Asians, I love Asians, I love that. More black people, more Asian people should be together, it's a fusion. I wanna open up an all black sushi restaurant and call it Nigiri Please. I have a vision, I have a dream. That's a perfect joke, that is a perfect, there's nothing wrong with that. 
nigiri is a form of sushi. And then I said, nigiri, please. And now I had tears in my eyes when I wrote that joke. I'm like, this shit is going to bring the people together. That's what that's going to do. I know that much. <laughs> oh, it's going to be perfect. They're going to love me. Racism is just, just over. That used to be half of what I talked about. I did eight years just on that alone. That was good. Right? It was, yeah, it was easy. It was, it was cake. And, and COVID's over now. And I was talking about that for a year. And, and it's, it's just, it's over. Fauci retired. He's just gone. And nobody cares. Nobody. Because we, we were just, we were just having, what? He's gone? Yeah, he's gone. The guy that was telling you what to do for two years straight. Gone. You don't care. Why would you? I didn't trust him. It's not, it's not about COVID. It's when he walked out on that baseball field and threw that bullshit ass pitch. I knew he wasn't to be trusted. You knew you couldn't throw before you accepted the invitation to go out there. That's not somebody who uses the scientific method properly. You knew you couldn't throw it. I didn't know George Bush Jr. that well. I didn't know his presidency. I do remember he walked up on the mound one day, threw a perfect fastball right over the plate during 9-11, during that time. I remember that. He did something else back then, I can't recall. It was something going on, but, but I, remember, I remember the fastball. That was important to me. There's parts of COVID that I, I miss. Remember we tried to recreate the magic when it was over, we're like, hey, uh, uh, monkey pox? <laughs> nah, no. We tried it. We tried it. You heard monkeypox? You're like, we, we can be home again? Like, no, no, not for monkeypox. I'm sorry. It's... We, always, we always fuck up with the names. We don't do the names right. The names always sound so ridiculous. We always take it as a joke. Bird flu, swine flu, coronavirus, monkeypox. It sounds playful. Name it gorilla herpes. Exactly what it was. And then maybe you could have yourself another pandemic. You fucked up. I miss the masks. I do. I do. No, I miss them. I know you don't miss the masks, but you have to understand where I'm coming from to watch white people feel oppressed in that moment like you all were going through it. Oh, man. Oh, that was a rough time for white people just in general. How dare they stop you from doing this one thing that you love to do. They made you wear the mask. Those bastards, you were just going through it. You, ever, you don't find it weird that no black person said anything about the mask the whole time? We were just sitting back enjoying that shit. We're like, this is worth it. I'll just make my mask match with my outfit as long as you all keep feeling sad. Like, this is fine. I'm good with this. Y'all were getting pissed off. Oh, man, I was in the Bahamas watching your asses on the news. Idaho made the news. Y'all were burning masks and shit. We will not stand for this. We were like, all right, sit the fuck down. You don't have to wear it when you sit down. Like, just chill. Like, do, just do it then. Do it that way. The masks were so weird in general because that whole logic didn't, it's like when you sat down, you didn't have to wear the mask anymore. That's weird. Imagine a con that only worked when you were fucking standing up. <laughs> How effective is that? Like, come on, baby, take this off. We're sitting down now. We, once we start eating, we don't need this anymore. It's... I miss it. I miss it all. If I can think of anything what lesson that I would take more than anything else um, on a serious note. <sighs> Ladies, if your man had COVID and didn't eat your ass, he didn't love you. He did not, he did not love you. Make changes. I mean it. Because I don't care what side of the spectrum you're on about eating ass. Last I checked, there's only two reasons why you don't eat ass. And that's taste and smell. And for two weeks, those chess pieces got slapped off the board. You had two weeks to do whatever you felt like for the person you love. It was two weeks. I, I call that the devil's hall pass. You had two weeks to do whatever you wanted to do for the person you loved. I was hoping to catch COVID, just hoping to make new friends. <laughs> Every morning I cooked three pieces of bacon and just left and went to the other room. If I could smell it, I didn't have it. I was sad.
That's the first time you laughed all night. Like I was, I was waiting for it. He held it for an hour. He's a... <laughs> I was like, I'm not leaving till this dude makes eye contact and laughs with me. <laughs> I want you all to know that for me, I've always been in a situation where I wonder, like, where, where, where's my home? Where's, where's family? What's, what's family for me? I always felt like this was family for me, um, mainly because I don't have to know everybody to, to know what Boise is, to know what it stands for. When I first came here in 2007, I remember I went to an open mic. It was at a comedy club, and I'd never been to a comedy show in my life. And there I was, July 3rd, 2007 watching a real-life comedy show. Now, I didn't know what an open mic was. I didn't realize that that meant anybody can go up there and try comedy for the first time. I thought I was watching 10 back-to-back -back professional stand-ups be the worst fucking comedy I'd ever seen <laughs> in my entire life. And I thought to myself, this is comedy? I can do this. And I walked up to the manager, I said, how do I get to do this? And he said, oh, we'll give you three minutes next week if you come in. And so I went in, and the person that went up before me was a man by the name of Jesus the Gay Jew. This is a true story. Jesus, do you, do you remember this, Brian? Yeah. Je remember that, Mundek, you were there? Yeah. Jesus the Gay Jew gets on stage. He, he had a bottle of water and red wine. <laughs> and he... He poured the red wine in the water and said, White Zinfandel, motherfuckers. And then he walked off. And I had to follow that. And that was the first time I was on a stage. And I walked up. And I'm like, <laughs> there's nothing I can do after Jesus the gay Jew has blessed me. It's such a magnificent set. I went up there, I talked to this day. What I said on that stage was a complete blank. I blacked out, I was nervous. What I remember from it was that they laughed. And had they not laughed, my whole life would be different. But they laughed, and you all laughed tonight. Thank you. here for me technically <laughs> I just knew in my heart cuz like if you look at this room and thought everybody's here for him that means I have more Jewish fans than black fans <laughs> like, on a representative level I'm not saying I don't I'm just saying like it was news to me like it was <laughs> and switch it up and are they talented what uh, are they talented See, that's the appropriate response. You see what he's doing? Do that next time when I... Because they're not talented. That, that was the joke. You understand? Like, that was... My boy, Alvin Wayne. Hey, Alvin. This is your favorite figure skater ever, coming to you from Back Deck, our favorite spot. Thinking of all the fun times you made me laugh and kept everything light. I just love watching his work. I just love watching what he does on stage and how he keeps his craft on point. I'm proud of you, man. You went from open mics to your own specials. I remember in 2009, you said to me, to give you three years and you were gonna be doing big things. And here you are. I was just thanking you for 
bestowing your your gifts, your your sweat, your blood, your tears. You've been hustling, you've been grinding, you've been making things happen. You're doing it all on your own. And turning them into little glittering diamonds of laughter for the world uh, because we need it now more than ever. You are a little black Jesus, and I thank you very much. That's my little brother, man. I love that cat with all my heart. Love you, man. I just love you to death. So there's that. Alvin, terrific job on the new special. It was hilarious. And let me tell you, I'm in here pumping up my biceps and you are over there pumping out new specials. Let me tell you one thing about Alvin. We'll be back.